used to be, this was all dry land farming. Down south and west of Amarillo, you still see a lot of dry land crops, things like cotton and wheat. But today, most all of this land is irrigated. This is the Texas Panhandle. Once it was dry and desolate. Today, irrigation is helping to make it one of the most important farming areas in this country. But irrigation is only part of the Texas Panhandle story. Stay tuned for the rest of that story on this week's U.S. Farm Report. Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report, seen on this station each week at this time. Through the weeks in our U.S. Farm Report series, we have had the pleasure of introducing to our television audience many of the executives and leaders of the National Farmers Organization. Today, for the first time in our series, we welcome a board member, and I'm talking about Mr. Clarence Ewart. Clarence comes from Mountain Lake, Minnesota, and represents agriculture all across these United States on the board of directors of the National Farmers Organization. Clarence, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our show. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure being here. Now, I understand that you have indeed a farming background. However, you're not actively farming at this time. Tell us about that. Well, I was born and raised on a farm northeast of Mountain Lake, Minnesota. And, and uh, when I enrolled as a member of NFO, I was farming uh, 400 acres, mm -hmm. Bill. What were you producing on your acreage? I was producing uh, Milo. Um, Soybeans and corn. Uh -huh. Now, you today uh, work full-time for NFO. That is correct, Bill. And uh, I guess that uh, it's a pretty difficult job to work for NFO and maintain your farming operation all at the same time, isn't it? Yes, it is. Tell us, Clarence, about your farming background. Well, Bill, I'm still living on the same farm where I was born and raised in northeast of Mountain Lake, Minnesota. And I was just on living on a family-type farm. In the early years, we had dairy, hogs, uh, fat cattle, had corn, flax, soybeans. In recent years, I've been more or less uh, producing corn and soybeans and a cattle and hog operation. Mm -hmm. Now, you have been an NFO member for how long? I've been an NFO member since 1960. What so. first attracted you to the organization? Well, the first time I heard about the National Farmers Organization was in the spring of 1960 when somebody from Iowa came into our local elevator there and mentioned uh, something about a holding action. Mm -hmm. And later on that summer, I, uh, I saw a notice uh, on a business place store explaining holding action. So I attended that meeting that evening. What about uh, NFO strength and membership through your state of Minnesota, Clarence? Uh, every county, every productive county in Minnesota is organized in the National Farmers Organization, Bill. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear your comments, having been a member of NFO as long as you have, having served on the board twice, uh, regarding uh, the effect of NFO to the farmer of America, and perhaps almost as importantly, to the rural businessman. The effect uh, to the farmer as, uh, is because of better prices. We've received better prices since we started our collective bargaining effort. And, and it's the same principle that businessmen use up and down Main Street. When they mm -hmm. have the production to sell or product to sell, they hold it for a price. They put a price tag on it to cover cost of production and a reasonable profit and then hold it for that price. The American farmer needs to get in the same position when, when enough production is blocked together so we can put a price tag on that production and hold for that price, we will get exactly what the American farmer needs to have to stay in business. Mm -hmm. Well, Clarence, through all this vast area you travel, I'm sure that you have seen the effect of NFO on agricultural prices. Tell us about that. Well, wherever farmers 
have organized in large enough groups, Bill, and block their production and bargain together and sell together, prices have increased and it's had an effect nationwide. Mm -hmm. And when this has an effect uh, nationwide, it also helps the businessmen up and down Main Street in rural America. Well, now, there has been a trend across the country, has there not, Clarence, of the rural businessman, the small town businessman, going out of business, as there has been a trend toward the reduction of the family farm, the numbers of family farms. Yes. Whenever uh, uh, 10 families leave the farm, a businessman is going to close its doors up and down Main Street. One businessman at to least, 10 families. At least one businessman will close its doors when, every, uh, when 10 farmers leave a community. That's an interesting ratio. I think that uh, in past programs we have talked about the fact that there is an exodus from the family farm at the rate currently, I believe, of 2,500 per week. Now, this will give you some idea about how many small businessmen are going under that as certainly a result. Is, that certainly is correct, Bill. Well, now, you have seen NFO grow through the years. What has stood out in your memory in NFO's growth? Well, Bill, wherever I go, there are people that are concerned about their way of life and the, on the family farm. And whenever we get into an area and explain the program, uh, using the same principles that every other segment of the economy is using, uh, they soon uh, enroll with us and start blocking their production with us and help us in our bargaining efforts for better mm -hmm. farm prices, Bill. Mm -hmm. Haven't you observed some vast changes in leadership in NFO through the years? Oh, I certainly have, Bill. The, uh, we're noticing in recent years that the more progressive farmers are looking to the National Farmers Organization for uh, help. They all realize that on their own, they're, it's impossible to get a price for their products. Mm -hmm. Together, un in a united effort, uh, everything is possible in agriculture, mm -hmm. just like it is in any other segment of the economy. Clarence, representing NFO, you do, as you said, a lot of traveling covering some 16 states. Uh, what's been your impression of the membership in those states in terms of growth? The membership is uh, increasing by leaps and bounds uh, throughout the areas that I've traveled and from all the reports I have this is going on uh, nationwide. The more and more farmers are adopting the principle of collective bargaining and, uh, and joining with us and blocking their production and giving us the opportunity uh, to have tremendous successes in mm. the bargaining effort for better farm prices for the American farmer. What about opposition? Do you find that diminishing? Opposition is diminishing, yes, Bill. Now then, uh, as you know, our having uh, visited a little while ago, we were in the Panhandle area of Texas at the same time, in fact, in Amarillo and uh, in certain areas near Amarillo. And I'm sorry, by the way, I missed you there. But I guess you were doing some traveling in areas that we were not in. Uh, we were on a field trip for U.S. Farm Report in the Panhandle area, filming the agricultural scene. How do you feel about the Panhandle area, Clarence, agriculturally, and where, uh, as to where it fits into the national agriculture picture? The agri as far as fitting into the agricultural picture, Bill, uh, that area, the Panhandle of Texas, is developing more and more land, more and more productivity uh, through methods of irrigation and developing more and more land for production which we need to feed the people of the world. Yes. It's a unique area in that respect. We enjoyed uh, filming uh, some of the irrigation areas through there. Uh, we talked with people about the water table. We learned something about irrigation, which of course is rather strange in some ways to those of us who live in the Midwestern part of the country. But uh, the water table in that area, as I recall, is generally around, what, 250, 300 feet? That is correct, Bill. That's uh, the information I have. Yes, and it's lowering, and uh, the farmers are having to do something about that. They're having to go a little deeper for their water. But it is a fine irrigation area. And uh, irrigation has uh, certainly brought about a great uh, farming prosperity in terms of crops. Perhaps not always in terms of price for crops, that but at least uh, these farmers are busy and doing a good job. I presume that many of you watching know that the Panhandle area of Texas is a great milo producing area. This is true, isn't it, Clarence? Yes, it is. 
Uh, before they came in there with irrigation, that land was capable of producing all the way from 3,000 to 4,000 pounds per acre. Mm -hmm. And when they started digging wells, sinking wells in the various areas, they found that they had plenty of water and uh, soon were able to produce all the way from 6,000 to 8,000 pounds per acre. Well, those Milo fields, uh, while we were there, looked beautiful. And uh, while we were there, of course, there was some Milo harvesting going on. But uh, it's obviously great Milo country. What, why are people growing so much Milo in that area? Well, they, everybody wants to produce more, you know, when the profit level per unit is down. Right. And when they started producing more Milo, uh, naturally they had to feed it to something. So this led them into feeding cattle, and we're finding large feedlots now with the uh, potential of all the way to 100,000 head of cattle per lot. We spent some time at one feedlot capable of feeding 50,000 head of cattle, and I thought that was big. But uh, they go really to as many as 100,000 head. Well, Texas is big, you know. They can really <laughs> expand over there in all directions, uh, Bill. We were interested, too, in uh, watching uh, some sugar beet harvest there. That's pretty good sugar beet country, isn't it? Yes, uh, there's a lot of sugar beet being uh, raised, and again, because of irrigation, the uh, potential to raise sugar beets is uh, bigger than ever. Mm -hmm. Some of those beet farmers have had some problems in that area, however, as you perhaps know, Clarence, with uh, leaf rot, which has resulted, I think they told me, in a rather low sugar content by comparison with other years. While you were there, did you meet the Doyle Terrell? Yes, I did, Bill. He's a fine young guy, isn't he? He certainly is, one of the pro progressive farmers in the panhandle of Texas. That's right. He was most cooperative with our uh, U.S. Farm Report staff. And in fact, uh, our cameras, while we were in the panhandle area, recorded this interview with Doyle Terrell. I would like for all of you to meet a young Texas farmer who farms near Amarillo on the high plains of Texas. Doyle Terrell is NFO president for Moore County, where he resides and farms. How many acres are you farming here? About 1,100 acres. About 1,100. Mm -hmm. how, uh, how much acreage uh, is in cash crops, Doyle? In cash, well, this year I have about uh, 400 acres of uh, Milo and about uh, oh, 170 acres of wheat, and it was about uh, 100 acres here of uh, of mustard. Uh huh. Now, this part of Texas is irrigation country. Yes. We How long has it been that way? Oh, since about 1955, when they really got started. And uh, the peak when we really uh, drilled most of the wells was uh, the 60s, the first part of the 60s. Well, now, 1955 is only about 15 years ago. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> and that's in the fairly uh, recent past. What was this country like uh, prior to the uh, irrigation matter? Well, it was vast fields of dry land wheat. It was about, about the way you'd explain it. Mm -hmm. Just uh, sections upon sections of dry land wheat. We didn't have much uh, maize or any of the other things. Yeah, and now, of course, <coughs> maize is the big crop in yes. this part of Texas. Milo is our biggest crop. Right. And this is what we work on, Milo. Corn is beginning to come in and take over a little yeah. bit. How far down do you have to drill for water through here? Well, the water table is about uh, oh, 250 to uh, 275 feet. But we usually go on down and drill our wells around uh, 475 to 500 feet. I see. <clears throat> what is the uh, situation uh, pertaining to the water table? Is it going down? Yes, we're dropping some. And we've what lost are, some What water. are you doing about that? Are you drilling existing uh, wells deeper, or are you drilling new wells? Well, we can't drill too many of them deeper. There's, they weren't set up that way, and we're having to drill new wells. And it's costing another uh, oh, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars 15000 to drill a new one. Yeah. And, of course, the original well cost around uh, 17000 with a motor and everything. But uh, it's beginning to pinch a little bit. Yeah. Well, Doyle, in irrigation, in terms of gallons per minute, what is considered a good productive uh, irrigation well? A good, good productive irrigation well would be about 900 gallons a minute. 900 per minute? Yes. Now, how are your wells doing at this time with this lowering of the uh, table? Well, I've got three that are doing real good. Three of them are still holding their 900. I've got one over here that's uh, dropped from about 700 down to about 300, 350, and it's really falling off. Well, now, and that represents a fairly expensive situation, doesn't it? Well, you've got the yes. same amount of money invested in that well as you have in the well that produces 900. Mm -hmm. And it costs about the same thing to run it. To run it. This is what hurts. Yeah. And uh, we've got the same investment, costs the same to run it, and it's just costing all the way around. Well, now, all through the uh, Amarillo area, 
What are uh, the farmers doing about this uh, lowering of the table? They're uh, going ahead and replacing some of the wells. Yeah. They're having to. And uh, this is costing them around $15,000. And uh, of course the original well cost 17000 with everything pump and all in it. Mm -hmm. And then they're having to redo the pump and uh, go on down a lot deeper. Have you noticed an increase of dry land crops? No, no increase of dry land crops. No. It's, it's irrigated. What else is dry land? Uh, you mentioned wheat. Is there dry land cotton in the area? No, no cotton in this area. We don't have but any up, cotton. But uh, up on the other side of Amarillo. Down, down below Amarillo. Or down below. We're up, upper. aren't we? Yes, we're, we're north. Up. We're uh, north of Amarillo. We're about 50 miles north of Amarillo. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, Doyle and I had the pleasure uh, of going down to the southern uh, section, a few miles uh, south of Amarillo, around Hereford, Black, yes. mm -hmm. and Vega. And we did see some uh, cotton growing down there. Now, that cotton looks a little bit stunted. Is it dry land cotton it for that would, reason? Uh, a lot of it is dry land cotton. Yeah. There's some irrigated, but a lot of it is kind of dry land. How long have you been a member of NFO? For about, uh, oh, 15 months now. Well, we uh, saw NFO in action together, and I yeah. thought it was a very thrilling experience. Uh, the uh, convoy to the cattle feeder yes, of uh, grain on contract to him. Uh, have you ever seen anything like that before? No, I sure haven't. This is the first time I've seen the farmer go to to uh, some effort to deliver his product straight to the consumer. Well, now without going in between. Is this, in your opinion, simply a matter of NFO displaying the fact that when they make a contract, by golly, they keep it? We're going to keep it. You're not a kid, and we're going to keep it. We've got to keep it. Yes. And uh, this is what we're doing right now: is uh, delivering on this contract that we had down here at Friona. And we're going to, if we have to come in from all areas of the Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico, we're going to bring her in and fill her up. Mm -hmm. You're always on the outlook through this area for a new cash crop. Yes. And we're in fact, we're standing right now uh, here in uh, a volunteer mustard field. Yes. And, uh, uh, you've been experimenting with this, haven't you, Doyle? We've, we're working on trying to find new cash crops, new ways of getting, uh, replacing some of these old cash crops. Wheat's pretty well out, or seems to be right now the way its situation is, and uh, maize is in good position, but we're looking for things like mustard and some of these uh, things where we can replace some of this cash mm -hmm. crop and get some others back. Now, of course, in this area, they've got sugar beets that they're working on, and the boys had a bad time with those this year because of the moisture. Sugar content went down when the when, moisture went up. Yes, when we had a lot of rain and uh, leaf spot on the sugar beets, yeah. the uh, sugar content of those beets went way down where they couldn't even hardly harvest, uh, pay the harvesting. Doyle, to get to your Milo production, is it uh, accepted practice through this country now to uh, plant three rows? Well, uh, this is one of the ways they were telling us to increase our uh, efficiency and uh, get more production per acre. Which is a necessity. And this is a yes, necessity. Is. I kid you not. And uh, this is one way I have gone to. Some of the men have been uns unsuccessful with three rows. And the only reason I don't like it is when it falls, I've got problems. Yes. But otherwise, I've been able to increase my production with this three row. Well, now, you have a little bit of a problem over here in one field that uh, we'll show everybody at this time. Uh, uh, when I planted it, I got the middle row down to moisture, yeah. and it came up early. Then I got a rain, and one side of the row of the bed came up. Then I got a good soaking rain, and the other side came up. So I had three maturity dates, which really uh, <laughs> messed up my harvest real good. Yes, well, you're going to be able to get in there right away, yes, I guess. Yes, uh, we had out. a good frost here, and I'll be able to get in there and get that out. What do you think it'll make, uh, nine, ten hundred? I'm hoping, thousand, hoping for nine, I was hoping for nine thousand, yes. but uh, this frost and uh, some of this uh, green bugs and a few things are going to probably knock it back down. I'd be tickled to death with seven. Would you? Is, uh, what, ten thousand? Bush or 10,000 pounds per acre. Is this, a, is this, this accepted is a, as a, a real good crop in this area? Well, it's actually too good. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'd say an average crop is around 6,000. Yeah. It's a good average crop, uh, average acres. Now, some men have been able to, on, on certain acres, been able to make the 10,000. Yeah. And uh, the problem is there, are you going to spend too much to try to make this 10,000? Mm -hmm. Are you going to really, really spend more money than you're making? I have trouble with this uh, pounds and bushels and uh, yeah. hundred weights and <laughs> all of these figures. You Hours know. or pounds here or yeah. hundred weight yeah. in this area. Well, now, over here, you have another Milo field that is cut very strangely. And uh, perhaps uh, you can tell us why. 
Well, this is uh, my decab seed field. Uh, I'm raising seed that, I, we're, that the men will be planting next year. And uh, we have four rows of male and 12 rows of female. The female is sterile, so we come in and plant it, and then we plant the male, and it'll cross-pollinate. Mm -hmm. And this is what we call a hybrid. Yeah. This is where the hybrid uh, situation comes in. And I'm raising this for the DCAB Research in uh, Institute or uh, company. Yes. Do they pay you a premium for this seed? Yes, we get a premium. Uh, they, it's different for the different types of seed. They have a different premium uh -huh. on the different types of seed. Yes. And uh, used to it was on the market price, but now they have got a, a straight price on it. Well, it's real nice of you to have us out. Well, uh, we, we sure appreciate enjoyed you coming. It, and uh, it's been a delight to have a good NFO member like you on U.S. Farm Report. Well, I'm sure glad you came out and come back when you get a well, chance. Well, we will. Now, uh, through the Amarillo area, what is the status quo of NFO? Is it growing? It is growing by leaps and bounds. We're going, we're really going places. That's it took fine. a little while to get a hold and get going, but now it's really going. Doyle, thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. D.N. Gamblin is another outstanding NFO farmer in the Texas Panhandle region from Sunray, Texas. He talked with me about sugar beets. It's quite a cultivation process. Tell us about that. There's two, two ways of growing beets here. There's a double row, which is two rows on the a, on a 40 inch centers. Mm -hmm. And then there's other farmers that use a single drill system. They plant them from about 30 to 32 inches apart on a single row. This field where you've been taking the picture is 32 inch rows. There's various types of cultivation practices. Everybody's got a different slant on it. Problem is to try to control weeds mechanically as much as possible. Mm -hmm. We've had a hard time doing it this year. Has this been a, as a result of the wetness? Well, that's part of it, but these beets normally, the ground is, uh, the beets are watered up. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get them real early, weeds come when the beets come up. I see. And uh, from that time on, it's quite a battle until you get a little uh, shade there. Well, now, as we look down these rows, we can see the effect of the topper. The topper has been through here well, and has taken the tops off. Yes, the topper is the last piece of machinery used before digging. It windrows these tops, four rows in a, in a windrow and that's consumed. It can either be picked up with an insulage cutter and made into insulage or just left to dry in the field and the cows come in and pick it up out of the field, mm -hmm. which is the common way in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, the next step, of course, in this process of harvesting is uh, the digging. And uh, this piece of equipment looks rather complicated, but I guess it really isn't, is it? Well, there's lots of wear and tear on it. It's, it's a tough job, but it does, huh? There's lots of moving parts, and it, it works in the dirt. Irrigation has helped panhandle farmers, men like Doyle Terrell and Deanne Gamblin, to diversify their farming and to produce a greater yield from their land. But increased yields and greater efficiency haven't helped these men to get a fair price for their crops, which explains the growth of the National Farmers Organization in the Panhandle area. Through NFO, these progressive farmers and men like them can participate in collective bargaining, can block together and sell together, and enjoy a better price for their production. These Texas Panhandle farmers are very much aware of the fact that in farming today, price is the name of the game. Yes, irrigation has made the difference, creating sharp contrast between irrigated wheat and dry land wheat that depends upon the whimsies of Mother Nature for life-giving moisture. Bringing water from 400 feet below the surface of the ground is little problem for this extra-large engine powered by natural gas. Water flow is controlled by gravity. 
Priming these pipes is no trick for an experienced irrigation farmer. But for the uninitiated, well, just try it sometime. And this precious water makes the land productive, capable of producing more Milo than in any other part of the country. And even some Texas-sized carrots. Yes, irrigation has made the difference in the Texas Panhandle, one of the most important agricultural areas in the nation today. And that's Doyle Terrell, one of our fine, progressive young NFO farmers and an all-around good fellow. It's been a real pleasure having you as our guest today, Clarence. I hope you'll come back and appear on our show at a later date. It was a privilege, Bill. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our guest today on U.S. Farm Report has been Mr. Clarence Ewart, who comes from Mountain Lake, Minnesota. Clarence is a member of the Board of Directors of the National Farmers Organization. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week. Until next time, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.